Hello everyone, my name is Madeline Austin Lehman with the Kenosha Public Library and I'm so happy to be here with Park Ranger Susan Philpott to present to you a special tour of the Belmont Hall National Monument. Um, we are going to get so many fun facts and good fun facts and Wisconsin-centric fun facts regarding women's suffrage movements and voting rights movements. So excited for you to be here with us. If you have any questions, please put it down in the chat. I will be moderating the whole time and I'll, we'll have a Q&A at the end and I'm happy to go ahead and ask those questions. But if you also wanna ask a question personally, you let us know and we can put that, um, give you your video and mic access and we can ask at the end. But in the meantime, please keep your videos and mics off and enjoy this wonderful presentation from Ranger Phil. Thank you so much, Madeline. And even though it looks like I'm coming to you from the hallway of the Belmont Paul Women's Equality National Monument, I am dialing in from my house. And apparently my dog Chester has decided that he needs to let us know that somebody's walking by. So I apologize that Chester will be part of our recording. So as Madeline mentioned, I am park ranger Susan Philpott from the Belmont Paul Women's Equality National Monument. Um, and if that title National Monument sounds a little weird. It's because um, at, there are several ways that a site can enter the National Park Service. A national monument is something that a president can declare um, without it getting passed through Congress because apparently there was years and years of trying to get this site to become part of the National Park Service that wasn't happening. So on April 12th, 2016, which that year was equal pay day, the day that women on average have to work into the new year to um, make as much as an average man. Um, President Obama came to the site and dedicated it and said that he really wanted there it to, it to be a time when young girls and boys came to the site and couldn't believe that there ever was a time when women couldn't vote when women didn't get paid the same as men, and even when a woman wasn't president. Um, so this is my park. We are a 200 year old three story brick house uh, on Capitol Hill in Washington DC on the corner of Constitution Avenue and Second Street Northeast. So we look right out over the side of the Supreme Court. We can see the Capitol Dome in the uh, distance. And that white building you see there that we kind of sit in the elbow of, that is the Hart Senate office building. So a number of senators have their offices that look right out over our courtyard. Um, and you'll notice in this picture, this was taken last month, there's a lot of scaffolding uh, along the side there. Uh, with 200-year-old houses, um, there's often a lot of work to be done. Um, and uh, that was um, one of the things that when this became part of the National Park Service, we set out to do. And we recently got a, a, a grant to, to make that happen, or actually funding through the Great American Outdoors Act. Um, so we closed for COVID, um, but then we aren't reopening because of the rehabilitation work. Now, why is this part of the National Park Service? It's because it was the historic headquarters of the National Woman's Party, founded by Alice Paul. Um, and it was their headquarters for over 90 years. Um, they moved in in 1929 and they were there until um, December of 2020. So they were still on, in operation when the National Park Service came in. Um, so, and this uh, is, uh, a picture of the entranceway uh, in 1974 when Alice Paul, the founder, was still living and working there when this was a, a hub of a political activity uh, for women. Um, as one National Women's Party member said, it's not merely a headquarters for our party that we plan, but an embassy for the women of the nation, a center of thought and activity and a vantage point from which they may keep Congress under perpetual observation. So they were very deliberate about putting themselves there on Capitol Hill. And then this is what the uh, entranceway looked like most recently. Actually, now the, the collections are coming out for the repairs. Um, 
So you can see it looked a lot like it did when Alice was there. Starting in 1997, the National Women's Party ceased their political activities and became an educational nonprofit, so a museum to keep Alice Paul's mission going by telling the story. Um, and we were very happy to join the National Women's Party. And that's we were interpreting the exhibits that they had created to tell their story. Um, and this is looking with that door in uh, to your back, basically looking down the hallway. The other way, you can see that the the um, walls of this entranceway are have uh, paintings and and pictures of lots of people, most of whom names probably are not uh, would not be familiar to you if I told them to you. Um, you probably know this person in this bust right here, though. If people know one name in the story of women's rights, they usually have heard of Susan B. Anthony for her tireless campaign throughout her life um, from 1851 until she died in 1906 for the cause of women's rights, particularly the right to vote. And that is the main story that we tell in, in our site is that last, the, the women who took up the fight after Susan B. Anthony died and Took the took the battle through to victory. Um, the bus that you see on the far side, we're going to see one other picture of her. That is the Belmont of the Belmont Paul, Alva Vanderbilt Belmont. If you are watching the Gilded Age on HBO, Alva was definitely one of those um, Gilded Age, very wealthy women, had a, a fortune several times over at her disposal and began to use it in social causes, initially in the labor movement, even marching with uh, women labor strikers. Um, they, the wealthy women who did that were known as the mink brigade because they would go out in their mink coats and then the police wouldn't uh, be likely to harass the strikers. Um, but then to the cause of women's suffrage and the right to vote. And she eventually became the primary benefactor of Alice Paul's work. She saw in Alice a kindred spirit, someone who was willing to, didn't care about being respectable or gracious, wanted to shake things up. So we're not going to see too much of Alva as we go through, um, but know that whatever we're talking about, it's usually Alva's money making it happen. And then this is the other side of the wall, and you see this bust of Alice Paul closest to you. Uh, that is a later addition. Alice Paul wouldn't have put herself up on a pedestal like that. Um, but And you'll also notice as we go through these great big mirrors, those were in the house actually before the National Women's Party moved in from the previous owner who had renovated the house. And when they created these exhibits, the National Women's Party turned these big mirrors into interactive spaces. So you'll see several of them as we go through. You'll notice this one has a sticker on it that looks like a frame. And the idea is if you're standing here in the hallway and you're looking at yourself in the mirror, um, it looks like you're one of these framed pictures there on the wall. And it's a way to say uh, everything uh, that these women did, you have that ability too. That's something that Alice Paul was really good at, at encouraging people to use their strengths, use their talents, and to be bold, to be courageous, to do things that they didn't think they could do. Uh, she believed in them, so then they believed too. She got people fired up. Um, she once said that she thought that the movement for women's rights was like a mosaic, everybody had their stone that they put in. So a lot of these pictures on the walls are, are not the names we know from history books, but those are all people putting in their stones and, and making the difference. So this is now looking into the or, what we call the origins gallery of the museum, um, looking at kind of the start of uh, Alice Paul entering the fight for women's right to vote. When you come in, the first thing you see is this cape and cap uh, that were worn in a suffrage procession, maybe the 1913 suffrage procession that we're going to talk about. The colors are a little hard to tell in this picture, but they are the colors of the National Women's Party, purple, white, and gold. You'll probably notice that color scheme as we go through. Uh, but in this room, we have two prized items in the National Women's Party collection. So over on the right, you see uh, a chair that once belonged to Elizabeth Cady Stanton. 
kind of the founding mother of the cause for women's rights and women's suffrage uh, in the United States. Um, she is one of the organizers of the moment that we sort of mark this movement, the Women's Rights Convention in St. Nicola Falls, New York in July, 1848, bringing together reform-minded people to talk specifically about women's rights, um, drawing up their mission statement, the Declaration of Sentiments, um, kind of a revising and correcting the Declaration of Independence, saying that all men and women are created equal. Most of that document is a list of all the ways women were not treated equally, and it was a really long list. So they were talking about some pretty controversial things, but it turned out the one that they were least sure of that brought about the most controversy was when Elizabeth Cady Stanton read out that it is the duty of the women of this country to secure to themselves their sacred right to the elective franchise. Women voting? Suffrage is another word for that. <laughs> now, Elizabeth, that's just getting ridiculous. That's going too far. Um, and there was a real question about whether everybody was going to sign on to that idea. It took Frederick Douglass, as far as we know, the only African American who attended that uh, that first women's rights conference, to basically stand up and say, "If you want the rest of the things on the list, then you need the vote." Um, and as the women's rights movement continued, eventually they really did begin to focus on that. That once you have the ballot, you have the power. If you notice in this chair, the seat is uh, much longer than our, our modern chairs. That was to accommodate a woman's skirts and bustles. So I, I always look at this chair and I think, boy, at a time when even chairs were gendered. Elizabeth Cady Stanton had the audacity to believe that women could be equal. And then next to that is a desk that once belonged to Susan B. Anthony. I mentioned she traveled all around the country. One of the places she came was to Washington, DC. I had an office here. So when Susan B. Anthony died, her longtime secretary got this desk and she gave it to Alice Paul in 1913 as a way to kind of say, you are taking up Susan's work. And here it is a picture of the National Women's Party gathered around that desk, getting inspiration from it. Uh, here's Alice Paul standing up and, and that's Alpha Belmont sitting next to it. But Alice Paul never met Susan B. Anthony. She didn't get involved in the suffrage movement because of Susan B. Anthony. She was uh, pretty young, a uh, much younger generation. Um, and she got fired up when she was attending graduate school in England, going to the London School of Economics. And she met the suffragettes. In the US, women writing for the vote preferred to be called suffragists, uh, but uh, they thought suffragettes was kind of um, insulting. But the Women's Social and Political Union founded by Emmeline Pankhurst and her daughters embraced the term suffragette um, and believed that, you know, you can only get so far given speeches and circulating petitions and uh, writing uh, editorials. If you want change, you gotta cause some trouble. So the suffragettes would stage great big demonstrations that would shut down all the traffic in the city. They'd show up where politicians were speaking and heckle and interrupt them. They'd break into places where women weren't allowed, basically make it so that you couldn't ignore them. Their slogan was deeds, not words. Uh, and some of those deeds included things like throwing rocks, breaking windows, um, other property damage. For all of these things, the women got arrested. This is Emmeline Pankhurst on the right getting arrested. They went to jail and they're the first ones to use the tactic of a hunger strike as a form of protest while they were in jail. So Alice Paul joins in these demonstrations. Eventually she's getting arrested along with the, the other women and she went on hunger strikes. The, uh, press in the United States is fascinated with this crazy American girl. What is she doing? And so Alice Paul becomes kind of a celebrity while she's over there and people are following what's happening with her. Also, while she's there, she, she meets a woman who will become um, her right hand soldier in the National Women's Party, Lucy Burns, another American. They met each other in a London police station. Whenever there was something really daring to do, Lucy was the first one out there. So Alice Paul is the political strategist. Lucy is the person 
putting that those strategies into place on the left as her getting ready to go up in a, in a plane to drop some suffrage leaflets. She was really tall, had bright red hair and striking blue eyes. So she cut quite a figure out there. So when Alice Paul returned to the United States in 1910, she comes as kind of a celebrity. There's a gaggle of reporters waiting for her um, at the dock when her ship comes in and they wanna know, Miss Paul, are you gonna join the American woman suffrage movement? And Alice Paul said that she didn't know there was an American woman suffrage movement, which probably didn't sit too well with the leaders of the American woman suffrage movement, including, Born in Wisconsin, here uh, in the middle uh, right, Carrie Chapman Cat. Uh, next to her is Anna Howard Shaw. They were two leaders of uh, a very extensive national suffrage organization called, unfortunately, the National American Woman Suffrage Association, NAWSA. We call it NASA for short. And NASA had, you know, coordinated campaigns across states. They had affiliated organizations and chapters all around the country, uh, including in Wisconsin. There were a few women's suffrage organizations in Wisconsin. On the left, you see uh, the Political Equality League, which was led by Ada James. On the right is Theodora, Theodora Yaumans. Um, she was the leader of the Wisconsin Women's Suffrage Association. They would eventually join those two organizations under the Wisconsin Women's Suffrage Association name. Um, and they had been fighting for years and years before Alice Paul, even before Alice Paul was born. Um, now, what they're concentrating on really is winning women the vote one state at a time, basically. And here's a map uh, uh, from... Wisconsin Historical Society, um, and giving you a sense of what's happening. So there are a few states where women can vote under the same term as men. Those are the ones in, in white by 1912. The one in, in, in black, women can't vote at all. But the other ones in kind of gray, that's where women have won partial suffrage. They can vote often on school boards or maybe in local elections, things that are considered okay for women to be involved in. Um, in Wisconsin, uh, women could run for school board even in the 1860s, but then they began to be able to vote in 1884, at least for a little while. In 1887, the court basically reversed it, so they lost the vote. Um, by 1901, uh, due in part to the efforts of Bella La Follette, wife of Robert La, La Follette, um, school suffrage is restored. Um, and by 1912, they, they're really pushing for a ballot initiative to win women full suffrage. That fails. And then the next year, the state eliminates elected school boards altogether, so women lose the vote altogether. Um, there will be another failed attempt in, in 1917. Um, here is uh, so the Oshkosh Equal Suffrage League in their July 4th parade campaigning for that 1912 initiative. And that's the kind of thing that frustrated Alice Paul. She thought, you know, this is too slow. Um, we get it little by little and half the time when we win it, we take it away. We, accepting terms for voting under different terms as men is just conceding that somehow we are unequal. Um, we need to, we need some of that energy I saw in Britain here in the US. Now she doesn't start breaking windows, but she does want, you know, something with a big spectacle that gets everybody talking. This is the exhibit panel in the museum about the 1913 women's suffrage procession that Alice Paul organizes uh, scheduled for the day before Woodrow Wilson's uh, swearing in as the new president. And they're going to take this right down Pennsylvania Avenue, the inaugural route, kind of uh, uh, placing their protest right there in the nation's capital, in the street, so that the next day the president is going to have to be walking in their footsteps. And she gets thousands of people from around the country to come. They're representing their states, their universities, their professions. Um, they are led by this woman here in the upper left-hand corner. That's Inez Milholland, um, not a name maybe everybody knows today, but 
she was pretty famous at the time. She was a lawyer. She was a dynamic speaker. She was a peace activist and fighter for civil rights. But the reason everybody knew her is because she was really pretty. Uh, so she was known as the most beautiful suffragist. So Alice Paul puts her out front all in white on a white horse as the herald of the future. This is the new woman of the 20th century. This is not your grandmother's suffrage movement. This is what a feminist looks like, she's saying. Um, and here is a picture um, that I believe is the Wisconsin women's delegation lining up, uh, although it could be from a, a different procession. That's what the caption says, that it's for the, the 1913 procession. You can see Oregon in front of them there. So women from Wisconsin who have traveled to DC. And so she's really got this idea that she's going to make this argument right there in the landscape about the accomplishments of women, the reason women should be enfranchised. What she's envisioning, though, is really only from a white woman's perspective. She sort of, she is a middle class white woman from uh, New Jersey. Um, she sort of assumes that maybe some black women will march, but she doesn't really bring them in at, to organize. Um, and then some of the women who are helping her organize from Washington, D.C., let her know that, uh, Alice, we don't do that here in D.C. Well, this is a southern city, and if you have an integrated march, the southern women just won't have it. So Alice Paul tries to convince the black women not to march at all, um, and then when that fails, she tries to put them in a segregated section in the back of the procession. Sometimes you'll read the history that will say that women marched in the back. I think black women marched in the back. It's clear that Alice Paul wanted them to, but we've got other sources that seem to definitely indicate that they refused to, that they marched where they belonged. Um, one story we know for sure is a brand new sorority from uh, Howard University, Delta Sigma Theta. Um, they had just formed to, with the purpose of being socially active. They want to march in this procession. Um, and their mentor, Mary Church Terrell on the right, is an internationally known uh, suffragist, speaks many languages, has traveled around the world, been involved with NASA for a long time. Um, and she uh, basically is much more prominent in Washington than Alice Paul is, and she uh, uses her, her uh, clout to make sure that the Deltas march where they belong with the other university women. She says later that the person who makes sure that happens is Inez Milholland. So if Alice Paul really was holding her up as the, as the new woman of the 20th century, maybe she should have paid a little more attention to, to being uh, looking for equality for all. And then there's another story that is one of my favorite with my favorite suffragists. We don't have a great picture of that moment, but Ida B. Wells Barnett, again, internationally known as an investigative journalist, a uh, fighter for um, an end to racial violence and lynching, um, and a suffragist. She has moved to Illinois, to Chicago, and so she's formed a, a suffrage club there. She comes with the Illinois delegation, but when they're lining up for the procession, somehow the, the white women get the, this idea that she's not allowed to march with them, and they're gonna, she's going to have to go to the back. She, Ida B. Wells is uh, indignant, says, you know, I'll march with Illinois or not at all. I was asked to come here um, to march, and this is where I belong. So she storms off, but she doesn't leave. She waits along the uh, procession route, and when the Illinois delegation appears, she steps right out in front. So the Chicago Daily Tribune uh, captured this um, photograph of her. It's We don't have a great copy of it, but... Um, this is Ida B. Wells here looking very determined, leading the Illinois suffrage um, delegation. Um, in addition to the marchers, there are bands and floats. The first float everybody sees is one that's got kind of the mission statement on it from Alice Paul. We demand an amendment to the United States Constitution in franchising women. So this idea, forget one state at a time and little by little, we want to change the U.S. Constitution and ensure the vote for every woman. And she chose that word demand deliberately to kind of shake things up. You know, respectable women are not supposed to demand things. Um, and you can see on the right what happened. Um, the crowds that had gathered didn't stay on the sidewalk, swarmed into the streets. The police didn't do anything to um, control the crowds and everything gets becomes a huge 
um, mob. Uh, there are drunk people in the crowd that are harassing the women, spitting on them and manhandling them. It's huge melee. Takes the cavalry coming over from Arlington to break it up um, for the women to finish the procession. But the next day, the newspaper is really not talking about Woodrow Wilson's inauguration so much. They're all talking about the women's suffrage procession. So Alice Paul's got everybody's attention uh, and she's ready to capitalize on it. Now, we here in Washington, D.C. see lots and lots of marches. Um, a march can get you some publicity, but that's not really the way things change. That just opens the door. Then you got to do the work, as this table from uh, has a quote from Alva Belmont on, on it. Uh, ours is the hard work, the painful work, the slow work. The work of making social change involves the letter writing campaigns and the phone calls and all the ways you get the message out. So there's lots of things going on in this room. One of the things that um, Alice Paul starts is a newspaper uh, called The Suffragist. And over on the left here, you see the first edition in November of 1913. There's some printing blocks over here on the right. Um, it features a cartoon that's kind of ridiculing Woodrow Wilson. Well, this gets Carrie Chapman cat very upset. You know, that's not the way we do things. Who, who are you? And by the way, NASA already has a newspaper. It's a very respected women's journal. Why are you publishing your own newspaper? Why are you burning political bridges? What is this woman doing? So pretty quickly, Alice Paul has a falling out with NASA and forms her own organization, uh, which is initially called the Congressional Union for Women's Suffrage. Uh, they change it later to a much better name, the National Women's Party. Um, and one of the things they've got is their very own political cartoonist, Nina Allender. She is a classically trained painter, but Alice Paul uses her skills of persuasion to convince her to become a cartoonist. And her work um, is making these great arguments in uh, really quick images, particularly that all the women she's showing are young and stylish and determined and confident, and they're out in public. They're not home taking care of the laundry and the babies. They are out demanding their rights. Um, and it's a way to counter the anti-suffragists who are uh, sort of painting those who want to vote as, you know, real women don't care about voting. This is just a bunch of ugly old hags who are bitter they can't uh, get a husband. And she also has a very biting sense of humor. Um, this is one of my favorite, one of her political cartoons. You can see Cinderella over on the left, the woman without the vote. Um, she needs that constitutional amendment uh, to ride to liberty, but right now it's a pumpkin that needs to be transformed and it needs to go through the, the House and Senate, but those guys are just a bunch of rats. So she's looking to her fairy godmother to wave the magic wand and make things happen. And as you can see here, the fairy godmother is Woodrow Wilson, uh, kind of making fun of him a little bit. And this sort of sums up their strategy, which is that they are gonna put the pressure on the president. Wilson, you're the leader of the country. Your party controls both houses of Congress. We want you on board. And Wilson was not an ally. He said, ladies, I'm very busy. Voting is a state's rights issue. Go back to your states if you want the vote. Um, and so they stayed a thorn in his side his entire presidency. While lobbying Wilson, they also of course have to lobby Congress and they teach themselves how to be very good lobbyists. Um, they educate themselves, they have um, classes so anybody coming into town to lobby can get up to speed right away and they keep meticulous notes. What you see on the right here is one of their uh, voting records cards where they kept track of everything they knew about every member of Congress, not just where he stood on suffrage, but everything they could learn, like, you know, whose golf partners were or what church he attended or who's funding him. And also, what do we know about his wife or his mother? Can we get them on, on board? Um, that card index became known as the de deadly political index since they had the goods on everybody. And of course, if you wanna get something through Congress, you gotta get their constituents on board. So they went on uh, great tours all around the country. This is a, a train tour, the suffrage special stopping in Colorado. They especially went to places where women had the vote trying to convince them to use 
the power they had to support their sisters uh, around the country, you know, and use your vote to support the amendment to the constitution. They were also sort of suggesting maybe vote Wilson out since he's not on board. Here's Lucy Burns there on the side. Um, it doesn't work. Wilson is reelected and the states where women can vote, uh, almost all of them vote for Wilson. Um, so they decide, Alice Paul decides, you know what? We need a new strategy. So they decide they're gonna take this battle right to Woodrow Wilson's doorstep. And that's when they begin the tactic that they're best known for when they begin to picket the White House. This is them all lined up for the first day in January, 1917 to head out uh, and picket. Um, as you can see, it's a black and white photo, so you can't tell the colors of their sashes and, and tricolored banners there. That's their purple, white, and gold colors. And women would wear those sashes, not just to protest, but like to the market and to public events so that wherever she went, everyone knew this, this is a suffragist. Doesn't even need words on it. Everybody knew that, that those trademark colors. So they show up in the cold take positions at the White House gates and stand there all day long, not saying anything. Um, just in addition to those tricolored banners, they have these great big banners with big bold block lettering on them, most of which use Woodrow Wilson's own words against him. Mr. President, you say liberty is the fundamental demand of the human spirit. Mr. President, how long must women wait for liberty? That's another one of those mirrors. Um, and here's a couple of those original banners that we have in our collection. On the left, Mr. President, what will you do for women's suffrage? On the right, my favorite one, the young are at the gates. I feel like in any age, uh, you could have young people carrying that one. We're the new generation and we've had enough and we're not gonna put up with, with uh, less than what we deserve anymore. And we're coming for change, although, to be fair, there are women of all ages out there picketing and women coming from all around the country. You know, this is Maryland Day, um, but women are showing up and getting their names in their local newspapers, getting the words out about suffrage. Um, now, some people are really appalled by this strategy, particularly Carrie Chapman Cat. She hates this. She says, what are you doing, Alice Paul? Respectable women don't stand on street corners. You are making the suffrage movement look ridiculous. You're hurting our cause and you're, you know, tarring my reputation. I have to keep disavowing that I'm one of those picket people. But, you know, other people starting to admire them, you know, out there in all kinds of weather for months, getting more publicity, getting more attention, getting some more support. And then the US enters World War I in April of 1917. And now they are out there picketing a president during a wartime. That doesn't just seem unladylike. That's, that's unpatriotic, un-American, maybe even treasonous. Who do these women think they are? And you can see the crowds gathering to attack them. In this crowd, there's some, some sailors from the Navy Yard who have come over. Well. The police can't have this as women uh, are causing all this trouble. So they tell Alice Paul, that's it. No more picketing. You ladies show up here again. We're going to arrest you. And Alice Paul said it wasn't illegal in January when we started. It's not illegal now. We have a right. We are not stopping. And as promised, they are arrested um, for obstructing traffic. They get sent to jail because they won't pay fines. And then eventually the women's prison, the Occoquan workhouse, and more and more people keep showing up and getting arrested, getting longer and longer prison terms. Um, by October, Alice Paul decides she needs to be out there on the picket line. Uh, she's been um, coordinating things up to this point and they're gunning for her. This is dangerous. So this is her head in October. Her banner says, the time has come to conquer or submit. For us, there is but one choice. We have made it. If you can see there, she is quoting President Wilson, his reason for entering World War I. She's using that same reason. We stand for the same thing, for making uh, the world safe for democracy. She's once said, when men are denied justice, they go to war. This is our war, only we're fighting it with banners instead of guns. So the women begin to go on hunger strikes, just like uh, in Britain. 
The response of the American officials is the same as the British ones, and that is to force feed the women. Um, there's a pretty graphic description of force feeding from Lucy Burns over there on the right. Um, it really was torturous. Um, and the women had to go through it several times a day. The reason we have this quote is because Lucy Burns was able to write this down and smuggle this out. So it got printed in the newspaper. Um, prominent women like Alva Belmont are giving interviews and uh, the, one, the husbands and fathers of these women are, are speaking out. You're seeing pictures of women looking like this when they come out of prison. Um, public opinion really is starting to sway and turn against Wilson. So um, he sees the writing on the wall. He pardons all the women, lets them all out just before Thanksgiving, you know, so they can go home and cook Thanksgiving dinner. Um, and instead of doing that, they plan a large ceremony to honor all the women jailed for freedom. And uh, they're all issued this jail door pin. This is one that we have in our collection, which from this point forward, they will all wear. Um, yeah, very proudly to say that they were one of the suffrage prisoners. And they keep finding ways to get arrested. You, uh, burn Wilson's words in front of the White House. They climb up on statues in Lafayette Square. Um, and um, eventually, Woodrow Wilson changes his mind. But he says it's not because of those troublemakers on his doorstep. He said the voices of the agitators uh, reach me not at all, but he says, in fact, he does support an amendment cut to the Constitution and franchising women. Uh, whatever the reason for his change of heart, they were right to target him once he uh, gets in front of Congress and speaks out in support of this amendment. It starts to move, uh, takes a little while, but it does finally pass Congress on June 4th, 1919. Woohoo! But of course, there's two parts to changing a constitution. First, you got to get it through Congress. And then the second part is you got to get it ratified by three quarters of the states. Now, some states are on board really quickly, which is funny because there were a lot of failed uh, referendums for women's suffrage in 1917, not just in Wisconsin. But guess who's very first in line to, to ratify the 19th Amendment? It's Wisconsin. Now, I posted something about this on Facebook uh, today, and I knew I was going to get a response from Illinois. Illinois feels very strongly that they were first. They voted to ratify the amendment uh, an hour before Wisconsin's legislature did. But they made a mistake, and they had to do it again. Uh, so on our map, Wisconsin is first. Michigan was a little later in the day. Everybody thinks, though, we got to get this amendment ratified before the November 1920 election. We need three quarters or 36 states before the voters go to the polls again. Women need to be casting their vote for president. Once there's a new president, everything can change. That's a really short window, especially since some of these state legislatures don't even meet every year. They've got to call special sessions to vote on this ratification but they're getting it done, one state after another. By this point, 28 states have some form of women's suffrage, and it turns out that society doesn't collapse when women vote, um, and maybe the male politicians can kind of see the writing on the wall, suffrage is coming, and we better get on the right side of all these new women voters. So by March of 1920, they've got 35 states. Every time one of these states ratifies the amendment, uh, Alice Paul is becoming the new Betsy Ross. She's got one of those suffrage banners. Now she's turned it into a ratification banner and she sews a star onto the banner. Over on the right is the Nina Allender cartoon. You can see Arkansas, Nebraska, Montana have all ratified. Uh-oh, what's over here? Georgia. Their legislature specifically rejected ratification and they weren't the only ones. So there have been at least five states that have said no. They're running out of time and running out of states. So when ratification comes up for a vote in Tennessee in August 1920, everybody thinks this is probably our last chance. And this is the National Women's Party members who are down there in Nashville lobbying, trying to get uh, everybody on their side. 
the ratification passes easily in the Tennessee State Senate, but when it gets to the Tennessee State House, they hold a vote and it's a tie. Oh no, here we are, we're so close. We're almost there. Now we've just got to get one guy to change his vote. But of course, the anti-suffragists are down there too, trying to lobby to keep um, this um, amendment from being ratified. Um, they're each handing out roses to their supporters. So when they gather, if one of the lawmakers is wearing a yellow rose, he's a suff. He's going to vote yes. But if it's a red rose, he's going to vote no. He's an anti. Harry Byrne over here on the left, the youngest guy there, only 24. He's got on a red rose. He's voted one, no once already, but he's also got a letter in his pocket. It's a long letter, but part of it reads, hurrah and vote for suffrage and don't keep them in doubt. And it's signed, don't forget to be a good boy. Lots of love, mama. Feb Byrne told her boy to vote for suffrage and he did. He changed his vote. Tennessee became the 36th state to ratify the amendment uh, uh, 72 years after the Seneca Falls Convention. The women of this country had secured to themselves their sacred right to the elective franchise. Yay, this is Alice Paul with her completed ratification banner. Um, the amendment became part of the Constitution on August 26, 1920. So we celebrate Women's Equality Day now on August 26th. But of course, August 26 was not the day that women won the equality. It's just the day they won the vote. The vote was not the end. The vote was just the beginning. Alice Paul said, it's incredible to me that any woman should consider the fight for full equality won. It has just begun. There's hardly a field, economic or political, in which the natural and unaccustomed policy is not to ignore women. And so they continue the fight. NASA, which has always been the larger organization, better funded, better uh, connected, uh, NASA becomes the League of Women Voters. And this is a picture of the uh, first League of Women Voters chapter in Wisconsin. Um, and uh, the National Women's Party continues as well. They've got that deadly political index. They know how to lobby. They start lobbying for laws to change and to uh, get women's equality into the law. One of the first places they are successful is in Wisconsin in 1921. Wisconsin is the first state to um, pass an equal rights law. Um, and the National Women's Party chapter out there is very instrumental in that. Although there's a little clause in there that's supposed to protect any existing of women's privileges. And what they discover pretty quickly is that that one sentence gets used often to um, find a way to make sure women are not treated equally, you know, to protect them. Um, the National Women's Party also starts supporting women running for office. Um, it's not enough to be casting the ballot. Your name's got to be on the ballot if you want real change. Um, you got to be in the room when their decisions get made. This is another one of those mirrors. I love seeing uh, young girls and boys standing at that mirror and seeing those words, I oh, will run for office uh, uh, by their faces. Here are some, some of the trailblazing women uh, as Shirley Chisholm, the first African-American woman to be elected to Congress, um, once said, if they won't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. And I love seeing all the women who find ways to um, get their voices heard. Uh, Madeline Albright, the first woman to serve as Secretary of State who just died yesterday, she was very adamant that women needed to be involved in all parts of government. Um, so that's, that's the journey we're still on. Now, I always love to show this picture. Having pageants and tableaus was one of the ways that they uh, that women, that the people at that time sort of got this message out. Suffrage pageants were a, a big thing to do. In 1923, um, the National Women's Party holds their convention in Seneca Falls um, to commemorate the 75th anniversary of that Women's Rights Conference. This is one of the, the uh, performances they did there. And at that convention, they decide that they need to go back 
to the idea of amending the constitution, this time not for the vote, but for full equality. So Alice Paul and the National Women's Party are the ones who write the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, it had a different version at first, but this is the version that, um, that stuck eventually. Equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. It turns out that the National Women's Party is the only group, even the, even the League of Women Voters, even those who have fought for suffrage, don't think that this amendment is a good idea. They're worried about things like the, like the Wisconsin uh, law was worried about the ways that women need to be privileged and protected by the law because they have children and, and take care of the family. Alice Paul always argued that those things that are meant to protect women actually end up hurting women and treating them like they are inferior. Here's one of their lobbying cards uh, for the Equal Rights Amendment. You can see that uh, the senator from New Hampshire says he thinks it's a fool amendment is through putting embroidery on the Constitution, you know, women's equality, just embroidery in the Constitution. Now, here's something the National Women's Party never did. They never got involved in all of the ways that women were being kept from the polls, particularly Black women. And they were contacting uh, the National Women's Party and saying, help us, you know, there's uh, violence, there's poll taxes we can't pay, we try to register, they won't let us register, there's these literacy tests that are impossible to, to pass. Um, and the National Women's Party would not get involved. They said that basically issues of racial equality and gender equality were separate issues. So there are women like that have to continue the fight for the vote without the help of people like Alice Paul. This is Amelia Boynton Robinson on the left during the, the march from Selma to Montgomery after she's been terribly beaten. On the right is Fannie Lou Hamer testifying before the um, Democratic National Convention about the horrors and torture that she faced and, and all the intimidation uh, because she wanted to vote. And she said, I, I question, is this America? And, you know, it's a real, uh, you know, you can't know what would might have happened if things had gone differently. But we do know one thing, and that is one of the most important movements for women's equality came in the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Um, in the section that has to do with prohibiting discrimination and employment, and in the protected areas, race, color, religion, sex gets included. Now it gets treated like a joke, seriously. You don't think we have to treat women equally in the workplace, that's ridiculous. Um, and that really leads some in the civil rights movement who um, had not really been on board with the idea of the Equal Rights Amendment or the things that the National Women's Party did to change their mind, to see that the government wasn't going to enforce um, this prohibition against sex discrimination in the workplace. This is Polly Murray. Um, she is a, an important civil rights lawyer. Um, she coined the term Jane Crow to uh, capture what black women face um, as both those who are discriminated against based on race and sex. Um, and she changes her mind about the Equal Rights Amendment and begins to support it. And other women who um, had been in the civil rights movement or maybe just watched it happen and started to really um, take up their own equality as something to fight for. Um, and they began to take up the Equal Rights Amendment as a way to go about it. So this is in uh, the late 60s, early 70s. Um, they get the amendment through Congress 50 years ago this week, March 22nd, 1972, with bipartisan support. But then the backlash comes. This is Phyllis Schlafly. She's probably the best known of the anti-ERA activists, but she wasn't the only one. Uh, she was just good at really making people angry. Um, and she argued that equality is not something that's good for women. That equality would, again, rob women of those privileges and protections that they should have on the law, that equality was in fact oppression. Equality was something to fear. 
Um, and they had lots of things that women should be afraid of. Um, and uh, it, it works. It really turns the tide. Um, and, and the Equal Rights Amendment loses support. Um, I'll just notice these uh, stop ERA protesters are picketing the White House using Alice Paul's own uh, tactic against her amendment. Um, there is a big movement on um, the one year after Alice Paul dies, trying to um, get support for the Equal Rights Amendment, particularly um, to extend a time limit that Congress had put on it for ratification, because uh, they had gotten close. Lots of states ratified really quickly, including Wisconsin. Um, but then after um, Phyllis Schlafly started her campaign support, uh, evaporated. And so the amendment was three states short of ratification um, and the time limit was approaching. They did get it extended for another three years, but by 1982, the time limit had expired. No more states ratified and that was it. ERA was dead. Or so we thought until 2017, when suddenly out of the blue, Nevada voted to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, and then, um, Illinois, because Illinois didn't ratify it beforehand. Um, Illinois just ratified a couple of years ago um, and Virginia did at the beginning of 2020. So there's lots of lawsuits right now trying to decide, um, can the ERA be added to the constitution? It hasn't been yet. Um, there are states suing to make sure it doesn't happen. There are states who have rescinded their ratification. Um, so we'll see what happens. I would, wouldn't be surprised if it ends up in the Supreme Court. Um, but there's new attention on the ERA and really more conversations about what equality looks like in the 21st century. I do wanna also mention that one of the things that happened as a result of this new attention on the ERA was that there was a push uh, last year to pass an amendment to Wisconsin state constitution, uh, adding equal rights amendment. As far as I could tell, it doesn't look like that's gone through yet. But, um, but the conversation about what equality is, what it looks like, it is an ongoing question.